everyone. Good evening, good whatever time of day it is. Thank you for tuning in to Conversations with Dr. Don. For your first-time viewers, Conversations with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one-hour standalone talk shows where I interview interesting people like most of you out there about who they are as unique, one-of-a-kind individuals and about whatever it is that we have decided, decided to talk about. And tonight we'll be talking about equine facilitated psychotherapy. It's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and we have some key uh, staff and members here of the organization to talk about what that means and their involvement in it and a whole bunch of other stuff. And we are missing another member here, uh, Jerry Ryan, who was supposed to be here, but he had uh, an emergency, so he couldn't come on the show tonight. And I'm going to have him on later on because I've had him on before, and I have a good time with him no matter what we're talking about. But uh, uh, it's the first time I've had this many guests at the same time in this little tiny studio, and I want to thank my crew for facilitating it and arranging it and making it happen. And typically I have one or two guests uh, at a time, and the show is divided into two major parts. The first part is what I call the bio part, or getting to know you. So I talk about who you are personally, and the, the viewers have an idea where you're coming from with what you're saying in the second half. But I'm not going to do a bio on all of you because we won't have time to talk about uh, equine facilitated psychotherapy. <laughs> and that'll be your job for the most part, talking about what each one of these uh, other guests do. Uh, Jerry, I hadn't talked to him for some couple of three years, and I called because I like the PVA, which is Paralyzed Veterans of America, and I says, what do you got for us nowadays? Bring us up to speed. And then he mentioned your organization, and I says, hey, that sounds more exciting than you, you know? <laughs> and that's how this came into being, and then again, at the last minute, he had to bow out so he couldn't be here tonight. But let's uh, start off by saying a little minimal stuff, bio stuff about each one of these people from you so that we can see why it is they're involved in this psychotherapy, this movement. And don't have to talk about your religion or any other personal stuff, but uh, <laughs> why don't you introduce uh, the other members here and first of all say who you are and how come you got involved in this business. I'm Susanna Cleland Zamudio. I'm an ear, nose, and throat surgeon in Portland, Oregon. and. Uh -huh. uh, um, Sycamore Lane Therapeutic Riding Center used to be Sycamore Lane Welsh Pony Farm that I grew up on. And uh, it was kind of a dream of mine to turn it into a medical riding center. You grew up on that? Yeah. What does that mean? Um, I grew up training horses on this farm. <laughs> oh, you had a lifetime of it? Yeah. <laughs> and along the way you decided to become a, a medical doctor? Mm -hmm. Well, it's really in your blood, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're going to continue to do this? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I do both. If, uh, if I'm nice here, will you do a surgery on me? Uh, what do you need? <laughs> <laughs> I'll find something. <laughs> I've already told your boyfriend what lovely eyes you have, and if you look in my, my eyes as you're operating on me, I'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I wanted, to, um, I wanted to build a riding facility that could provide therapeutic services uh, in a medical way to people that had um, developmental problems, uh, speech and language problems, physical problems, um, mental health problems, and um, and we when we opened the farm in 2009, we started with just therapeutic riding, which is helping people with all disabilities in specifically riding lessons. Mm -hmm. And uh, as time has gone by, we've branched from there, and uh, now we provide hippotherapy which is occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, and speech and language pathology um, through the use of horses as a dynamic platform. And, uh, horses as a dynamic platform. Yeah. You're going to tell me what that means too, aren't you? Oh, uh, well, actually, <laughs> um, Heidi Roberts is our speech and language of pathologist. Course. Yes. And she works with uh, our children who are speech delayed, some of which are completely nonverbal, many autistic children, and she's spectacular. <laughs> and. Uh, um, Heidi, do you want to tell us a little bit about the hippotherapy? First of all, I'd like you to tell us how it is that you're involved in this. What is it about your childhood you're bringing up for her? It was, she was born into it, but how come <laughs> you're involved in this operation? What is it about you? Um, so when I was younger, my I have a younger sister, uh -huh. and she nearly drowned, and she ended up going through some speech and language services. So she technically has a brain injury. Um, but very high functioning, so she can get a job and do some basic stuff. 
Um, and I got involved at Sycamore Lane one day when I went in to get scoped because I was having some breathing problems and I saw her flyer. <laughs> she said, oh, you have to come out. And I didn't even like horses. So it took me a year. It took me a year to get used to the horses and to really appreciate them. And then from there, we decided that maybe I should try hypotherapy. So it's, it's a fascinating field. You're a speech therapist. I am. Are you helping your co-workers with their speech? I try to. <laughs> so far, they're doing fine on their own. <laughs> so you're next. Tell us how it is that you're involved in, in uh, this organization. Um, well, I spent my high school and some of my college years um, actually volunteering at a therapeutic riding center, and I absolutely loved it. Um, I've always loved horses ever since I was a little girl. You know, every little girl wants a pony dream. Um, went to horse camps, took lessons, and then um, found this volunteer opportunity through high school. And then, um, you know, went off to college, was kind of away from horses, but then really missed them and started looking, looking into how can I make a career out of this and how can I really, you know, use this to help the community. Um, and I have been working with, you know, troubled youth and really have just seen what an incredible difference that horses can make in people's lives. And um, so moved to the Portland area and went looking for, um, you know, a really great organization that I could join and help to grow, and that's how I found Sycamore Lane. Yeah, <laughs> and now let's hear your story. Well, um, I'm originally from California. Mm -hmm. uh, grew up riding horses, uh, began riding when I was five years old. Rode horses um, throughout high school and um, a little bit into college, but went off to college to pursue my uh, professional career, um, which is uh, kinesiology and, and teaching adapted physical education in the public schools. Um, and so um, I actually moved up here about three years ago to Portland. I have family up here and I uh, had a difficult fi uh, time finding a job in the, in the school system. As you know, it's uh, not easy for teachers these days. Yes. Uh, started volunteering at Sycamore Lane, and um, I had this uh, epiphany that, wow, I could use my background with horses that I never thought was more than a hobby, and my knowledge of teaching children um, with disabilities um, physical education and combine that. And so I uh, am an instructor and now the program director at Sycamore Lane, which is uh, an, a fabulous organization. I'm sure it is. I can see by your faces. I'm a retired clinical psychologist, among other things, too, so I have an idea where you're coming from. And I feel particularly warm about people who care enough about other human beings to do the kind of stuff you're doing. And I'm curious about how you you have horses involved because I've always been kind of wary of horses, even though I took a couple of riding lessons. But uh, will you pick it up from here and talk to them about what they're doing? About uh, what the uh, about the horses? Themselves? About the facility. Or sh you decide when we show these pictures. Oh, or sure. Who you want to talk next? Um, <laughs> um, well, this is this is why it was called Sycamore Lane. Mm -hmm. It's um, the property is um, over 120 years old, and we've got sycamore trees that line the, pro line the road that where you enter. Oh, isn't that beautiful? And, uh, and it looks really pretty in the winter when it snows, too. I and, bet. Uh, and then this is what our facility looks like. We have an arena and uh, the barn and uh, the office there. And uh, our facility serves as many as 85 d people with disabilities per week that ride or, pers or um, achieve services there. Where do you get your money, my goodness? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are a federal 501c nonprofit organization, and uh -huh. so it really is um, um, in-hand donations and fundraising and events, and uh, that's where it comes from. Okay. And uh, we try to provide about 70% of our riders have uh, their scholarship provides their lessons. They, we only we underwrite the majority of the cost of the lesson, and they just pay a very small fee to write, and uh, so. All the events and everything we do go towards scholarship for the riders as well as running the facility. Okay. And uh, uh, Lisa has been steerheading one of our new programs, which is the Equine Facilitated Psychotherapy, as well as our veterans program, which she and Jerry are very proud of. And these are programs that are fairly new to us, and uh, we wanted to expand on our services for mental health. 
There's a, a lot of people in the Portland area that have served our country, and um, mm -hmm. they they need camaraderie and they need community, and some need therapy. And uh, and the program that Lisa and Jerry have developed is spectacular. <laughs> and uh, and our, our our veterans can have a choice of just coming to the farm and learning how to ride, learning how to train horses, or they can be involved in the clinical psychotherapy program. It's their choice. And I'd love for Lisa to talk about how that's all been started. You betcha, because <laughs> yes. I'm a World War II vet <laughs> myself, and uh, I've not had any difficulties. Just, I was a peacetime uh, uh, veteran. Uh, but uh, I have a sentimental feeling for people who defend our country and, and, and fight, though I'm a a humanist and a, a peaceful person. That's my own personality, my own makeup. But anyhow, enough about me. Uh, I bet you got each one of you have enough stories to occupy an hour <laughs> for each one. No, <laughs> probably. Of people you're yeah. dealing with. You're going to talk about the veterans you uh, um, see and work with. Yes, yes, and really, um, you know, how it all started is. Um, I'm, I was a sociology major in college, um, so I really had an interest in, you know, how people interact with each other, you know, how um, people are affected by world events, you know, different groups of people, and um, really had read a lot of research on the veterans coming back from Iraq and how, um, you know, just astronomical numbers of them coming back with PTSD, um, ending up in the criminal justice system, and really just not having the support and services um, that they needed in order to um, sort of re-enter society and heal from the things that they saw and experienced during wartime. Um, so I wanted to, you know, provide a place at Sycamore Lane where they could come and just be human, um, you know, establish a relationship, learn how to rebuild, you know, bonds with the horses and through that uh, rebuild bonds with their families. Um, and really that was kind of the whole dream. And then with Jerry coming on, we were able to also give them access to um, psychotherapy services as well, if that's something that they felt like they needed. Um, so that's kind of where it all started, and it just um, really took off. We had an open house, you know, for them to be able to come and kind of feel the place out, see if it's something that they might be interested in. Um, that night they were able to bring their families out as well. Um, so it was really fun to watch, um, you know, the veterans bring their kids out, and the kids get really excited about the horses. <laughs> um, so that was a really neat night, and then um, we almost filled the program just from that open house. Um, and then now we've also um, tapped into Wounded Warrior Project, who they have money set aside for veterans to access um, equine services. Um, so they are really aware of um, how beneficial these services are for the veterans and um, what a difference the horses can make for them. That is good, but uh, you just uh, kind of tweaked me there with a comment you made a moment ago. I'm getting on my soapbox for a second. I've noticed a number of times on television there's uh, an advertisement uh, for sending so much a month to take care of our veterans who fought for us. And I've become so outraged that I can't even talk anymore because our government should be taking care of our veterans. So you don't have to s agree with me or not, but I said it and I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so. no, that's, that's an interesting that's point to bring up. That really is true, and I think that's one of the reasons, you know, I, after reading um, you know, doing a lot of research and reading all these articles about how many veterans had been swept up in the criminal justice system and really just kind of fallen through the cracks of the VA services. And I thought, well, that's really sad, especially because, you know, we had an all-volunteer force that yes. went to war these times. So really, you know, they should be taken care of tenfold because they did this on a, a volunteer basis. And so, um, you know, I totally agree with uh -huh. you with that. And that's one of the things where you know, I really was it's like, we need to do, yeah, do something to take care of them. And, um, you know, oftentimes for these veterans, it's also very difficult for them to want to go access services like psychotherapy and things of that nature because of the nature of the military and um, kind of the way they are bred when they go through training. And so, you know, I feel like the horses give them, you know, a way to kind of tap into their own um, feelings and become more aware of their own emotions and how to heal from those things without, you know, forcing them into a therapeutic setting that might make them very uncomfortable. So, 
Uh, but you've got some stories. But we're going to move on in a minute and hear some others because we'll come back to you and hear some more stories too. You remember the movie The Horse Whisperer? Yes, yes. <laughs> Have you heard of an, The Elephant Whisperer? Oh, no, the I haven't. The Elephant Whisperer. It's a heck of a book. <laughs> very beautiful. <laughs> uh, very briefly, this guy has a game preserve in Africa, and he gets a reputation around all over Africa. If you've got an elephant that you can't do anything with, you're going to have to put it to sleep because it, it hates humans, send it to me before you kill it. So over the years, he's had these elephants that come in, sometimes uh, two or three of them, and they just they, they see a human and they go crazy. And he's managed to be with them in the way over weeks and months at a time where they become normal, peaceful elephants. It's very heartwarming. The Elephant Whisperer, read it. I will, <laughs> I will. I'm so full of stories. <laughs> it's a wonderful, so wonderful great. read. It's very moving. But we'll come back to you and hear some more stories. Maybe you think of a particular veteran that uh, impressed you or did something to you. And I see your eyes are showing it, too. Yeah. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yes. Shall we move on, <laughs> boss? Um, well, one, fun, this, one thing that's pretty interesting, I'd like Michelle to talk about it a little bit, Yes. is um, um, one of the things I'm involved in as the executive director is I do all of the horse training. And so does Michelle. Mm -hmm. And um, how we choose these animals and how we train them to be able to handle working with people with disabilities. And um, they have to be able to handle someone who's seizing, someone who's screaming, um, a lot of unusual stimuli. And for our patients that are um, paraplegic or quadriplegic, they have to have, be able to be calm in the setting of an electrical device lifting a patient out of their wheelchair and placing them in the saddle. So it's a device that is scary to your average horse, and they have to be able to um, hold it together and, and do as they're told. And uh, sure. I thought it'd be fun for Michelle to talk about how we train the horses and how we pick them. Please. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so it, it takes a very special horse to be a, a therapy horse. Um, we generally get horses um, several different ways. Um, people call us. Um, they have a horse maybe that's getting older, uh, towards retirement age, um, and they call us and ask us if we um, would like to have a, a donation of a horse. Um, and we do have contacts in the community, such as veterinarians and, and other people that often recommend um, horses that might be good for our program. So we do take horses um, on a trial basis. And it's usually about a 60-day trial period. And we make sure that wherever that we get the horse from, um, they agree that if the horse doesn't work out, they're willing to take it back. Mm -hmm. That way, we're not just donated a horse and, and stuck with it. Um, we want it to have a home to go back to sure. um, if it doesn't work out. Um, and that's different some, than some of the therapeutic riding programs that get given a horse um, and don't know a lot about, it, about its background. Uh -huh. So we have um, 11 horses. Um, they're all different breeds, um, come from very different backgrounds. Um, we have um, a horse, um, for example, who is a retired uh, barrel racing horse. So she, when she came to us, she was either all go or stop. <laughs> and so we had to work with her to kind of find different speeds in between fast and stop. Uh -huh. And um, she actually turned out to be a really great therapy horse. Um, we have another horse. Um, What's a barrel our, horse? Uh, barrel racing in the rodeo. Oh, yes. So where they set up barrels. And yes. so, of course, because of that experience, she was very desensitized to crowds, loud noises, flags. And so she was able to deal with, um, say, a child screaming, um, you know, or running around. She was not affected much by that because she was so used to being in that setting sure. where she was exposed to that. Um, we have another horse. His name is Sonny. He's one of our oldest horses, about 27. And um, quarter horse. He, uh, in his uh, previous life, uh, before he was with us, rode uh, uh, trail riding all across the United States. Um, and he's one of our, what we call, most bomb-proof horses. <laughs> so he will stand just like a statue for you, and you can do anything to him. And he will just stand there and uh, let, you, let you do it. Um, <laughs> so he's uh, an, an, an awesome horse, and he's also one of the horses that we use for our mechanical lift. 
um, only uh, three horses that we have can use that lift um, because like Suzanne said, is it a device that comes over the back of them and since they're prey animals, um, their instinct is to run. So these are very special horses to be able to um, be a therapy horse. Yeah. Yes. So here's a picture of Sunny. And the rider that's on, Sunny, um, is in a wheelchair and he uses the lift to get on his horse. But once he's on the horse, uh, he loves to go fast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's one of his favorite things because in a wheelchair you can only go so fast. Uh -huh. But on Sunny, he has the ability to go faster than he ever could. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Here's one of the and we have a horse in training right now. He's a Norwegian Fjord. Mm -hmm. um, his name is Ven, and here's a picture of him. He's the youngest horse we have. He's eight years old, and he's still in training. How long does it take typically to train a horse? That's a dumb question because uh, it depends on the horse. It does. It? it depends a lot on the horse. Ven, um, being a Norwegian Fjord, they uh, mature later than a lot of the other breeds, um, so it might take him a little bit longer, but um, he's a wonderful horse. He has a wonderful personality and, and temperament and we um, got him knowing that he would have longevity with us in the program. And each horse has its own personality. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I bet you have some stories about the unique horses or different yes. horses that you managed to <laughs> yes. connect with. Yes, definitely. Uh, we have one horse in particular, his name is Buster. He's um, kind of our mascot. <laughs> he um, is a rescue from Portland Meadows Racetrack. Mm -hmm. He broke uh, both his front legs in multiple places and was going to be euthanized. And Suzanne saved his life. Um, she helped uh, rehab this horse. And um, now he's happy and healthy. And he has uh, special horseshoes that are like slippers. <laughs> and he gets um, <laughs> horsey pain medicine every day, kind of like an anti-inflammatory. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a wonderful horse. and. It just goes to show that somebody um, might have had an injury or, or be injured in some way can still um, heal and live a happy and fulfilling life, whether it's a person or an animal. So your patients in who, yeah, that's a good They can really relate. Mm -hmm. Really? Thank you, little mm -hmm. word. Wow. I'm, he I'm loves our riders. Uh, he knows he's rescued. Uh, question. Does a horse sense your mood or how you're feeling from day to day? Uh, yes, definitely. Oh, yeah. They can read your emotions, for sure. Uh -huh. And that's one of the great things about horses and the equine facilitated psychotherapy uh -huh. is that they can really mirror human emotions. Uh -huh. Are they ca capable of empathy? Yes. Oh, yeah. oh there's uh, some more yes. stories <laughs> happening here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is delightful. They have uh, better memories than elephants. <laughs> no. Yes. <laughs> oh, can we go for three more hours? <laughs> so, shall you continue some more or shall we move on now to somebody else? Oh, um, actually, I, I would love to have Lisa talk a little bit about... Um, how, what has she has seen in the equine facilitated psychotherapy? Because uh -huh. she's told me some of the experiences that her patients have had already and in working with the horses emotionally, the horses seeing how the client feels and reading their, reading their sorrow, reading their fears and mirroring them. And you can see that in the horse. Yes. Can you explain that? Yes. Um, <laughs> so. Horses, because of their, they are a prey animal, and because of their prey, um, prey nature, they're very hypersensitive to sensory stimuli, so things that are going on around them. And they mm -hmm. see the human initially as um, a predator. And so part of um, you know, building the bond with the horse, um, a person who, um, for example, you know, we have an activity where we'd have a person you know, be approaching potentially a group of loose horses and attempting to um, catch or halter one of those horses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if the person is, you know, in any manner, you know, somewhat aggressive or, you know, struggling um, with building relationships in their own life, the horse can read that and it forces the person to um, really kind of look inward at their emotions and what their body m language might be saying. Um, and so that's really, um, 
you know, I think an important part of it is um, people really learn to be able to read um, very small kind of bod body language movements because that's what the horse reads. The, so the horse is mirroring what's going on in, yes. in that person. Yes, And exactly. it gives that person a chance to see, without seeing it that way, this is a me I'm, I'm seeing here. Yes. And there's something to them. Yeah, Ooh. so that body language really, um, you know, can help a person tune into their own emotions. And even just um, some of the most simplest things that we do with the horse, um, for example, really just the process of grooming um, and learning, um, you know, different mes methods of massage or relaxing um, touch for the horse um, really can teach a person how they can learn to relax or regulate their own emotions. Um, so I've really seen pretty amazing things happen to people just during that grooming process, um, which was really surprising to me. Um, so just that kind of rhythmic, um, you know, grooming process. I have clients who will spend, you know, 30 to 45 minutes just being with the horse and grooming with the horse. And, um, you know, we teach them to look for certain signs of relaxation in the horse and then relate that back to, um, you know, reading signs of relaxation in a person. So, if we want to, we can learn a lot from observing intimately. Yes, horses. yes. And horses require, um, you know, a lot of pace, patience and oftentimes a lot of perseverance mm -hmm. when we're working with them. Um, you know, Suzanne especially <laughs> with her many years of training. Um, and so, we do a lot of activities, you know, that require a person to, you know, be patient and persevere to look for the right answer and to help the horse look for the right answer to whatever we might be um, looking for or asking for. Um, and so I think that's kind of the biggest teaching moment with the horses. So there's, there's a different level of communication human to horse and horse to human than there is with our normal senses. Yes. It's a sort of a sixth sense or something. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and what she sees as an instructor actually out helps her guide how to direct the lesson. For example, if she has a veteran who's coming to ride that day or, or work with the horses in a training setting, let's say that that, um, that veteran had a really bad day. He had a counseling session earlier, he maybe had a flashback or something, and came to our farm and maybe was agitated. If he gets on the horse, the horse is going to act agitated. And from that, Lisa can see it, and she can say, well, so-and-so, how's your horse doing today? Oh, he's, he's being naughty. Well, why is he being naughty? Perhaps is the horse anxious? Is the horse reading something in you? And uh, maybe if you help, like Rusty, if you help Rusty relax, if you relax, it helps Rusty know what to do. And she can actually see how she can guide him to, they can share those emotions and bring it down. Equine facilitated. <laughs> now I know what it means. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, what a wonderful sense. job you've got. Yeah, yeah it's, it is. it's very, <laughs> and I even feel, there's days where I feel very privileged to be in this line of work just because when you, and somebody, when I first um, started thinking about, um, you know, working in an equine facilitated psychotherapy setting as a career, um, you know, I had talked to some other people who were already doing this practice and they had said, well, we can't really explain it, but with the horses, stuff just happens. And I'm a very analytical person, sociology, I did a lot of research, you mm -hmm. know, it's very um, scientifically based. And I was like, well, what do you mean? Stuff just happens. I don't, <laughs> I don't get it. And now that I've been, you know, working in that capacity, it's, it's just really touching and really amazing when you see a client that's able to, um, you know, establish leadership with the horse and you just see a, a complete change in their demeanor over a period of several weeks. Um, you know, we have um, training techniques that we have them teach the horse and um, it helps them learn to establish themselves as a leader in the relationship with the horse and then they can take that back to their own life and um, use that in relationships with other people in their life as well. And it's just really amazing to watch someone be very timid with the horse, very unsure of themselves. Um, many clients have what we call performance anxiety. You know, they're not sure if they're doing it right. And we try to guide them some, but by allowing them to also um, kind of figure it out, that helps them, you know, apply that back to their um, life at home as well. So 
Yeah, and I keep twisting my head looking at my countdown clock, and they're going to yell at me if we don't take a break here, but oh. I want to warn you ahead of time. <laughs> During the two-minute break, there will be a couple of uh, announcements, and I'm a political animal. I'm an old-fashioned left-wing liberal, so don't be offended if you see some <laughs> signs that turn you off. So we take a break, Mr. E, Mr. Director. So the mics are off. Yeah. Oh, so I was instructed during the break to ask the question, how do you <laughs> <laughs> how do you become, how do you start an organization like this? Is that the question? Or is there another question that we should ask? No, I mean, a lot of people approach me and say, how did you figure out how to do this? I mean, how did establish a medical writing facility to treat all of these disabilities? And um, when I was researching, um, um, Course therapy, I came upon PATH International, which is the Professional Association of Therapeutic Horsemanship International. Mm -hmm. And PATH International is the governing um, body that reviews safety standards for um, riding facilities that serve disabled patients. Mm -hmm. And um, they have over 400 facilities in the United States and worldwide. Wow. And uh, in Oregon, I think there's 11, 11 mm -hmm. PATH facilities. Um, we're one of the premier path facilities. There's three in Oregon, and uh, which means it reaches the highest level of safety standard nationally um, for handicap riding. And uh, and so you're a, a, it's a governing body, kind of like OSHA for hospitals and JCO, mm -hmm. that um, supervises safety standards so that the um, the care and the safety is at the highest level. And uh, all right, so I was so excited about what's going on with my guests here until I forgot my. Uh, announcement uh, at the end of the break, so I will do it now. Uh, thanks for staying tuned. The program you're watching is Conversations with Dr. Don, and the title of tonight's show is Equine Facilitated Psychotherapy. I said it again. <laughs> <laughs> and my guests, uh, you will see their names up as the camera focuses on them. And uh, I'm glad you stayed tuned or you tuned in late because you were goofing off. So shall we pick up where we left off? <laughs> sure. Um, I wanted to go ahead and show uh -huh. a picture of one of our riders um, that's with Rusty and Michelle, his instructor. And uh, some of our riders come to us with one thing that they want to work on. It could be speech. It could be that they have, um, they're on the autism spectrum and they have difficulty socially interacting with their peers. It could be behavioral issues. It could be they want to build core because they're in a wheelchair. There's a variety of things. And um, I wanted Heidi, our speech and language pathologist, to elaborate on, um, I know that she has seen patients come to her for speech and language therapy, and yet they've gotten a whole lot more out of it than just that. Well, it, so when you put a child on a horse, we specifically choose a horse for that child because each horse moves in a different way. Sure. And so, um, the child may come to me for um, speech or language, but what we find out that is the whole body is affected. So then he also sleeps better at night. 
he regulates his emotions better during the day. Parents find that he's not having as many temper tantrums because the sensory uh, piece of it that he gets from the horse also affects his body. Mm. Not only the piece of speech or respiration or whatever it was that I was targeting. His whole system, you can't isolate the body because it's sitting on the horse. So his whole body is affected and we find that uh, they tend to think clearer or they sleep better, they eat better. Um, and so it isn't targeting one goal, it's targeting the whole person. So you see a distinct change in the people you see in your program? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. The whole I mean, person is affected. Is it gratifying to see that? Of course. Oh, it, can, yeah. <laughs> it, can, it, it can be very, very emotional. I mean, I, I can mm -hmm. still remember when we had a young lady, she's six, come to our farm for the first time, and uh, I was there in the audience with her mother. And uh, she was nonverbal. She was on the autism spectrum, and she'd never spoken. And uh, so she started writing, and, uh, and she was able to say five words her first lesson. She was, and she was able to see unusual words like duck and blue and go and stop. It wasn't just like whoa or you know, things like that. And mm -hmm. orange, she said orange. And, um, mm -hmm. and it was purely that the instructor had created such an air of dynamics with the horse that um, this little girl wanted to trot so badly and she was so neurologically stim stimulated by just being on the horse that the instructor used that and she wouldn't let her trot unless she said the word. <laughs> and and her, so she was screaming these words and her mother was just in the audience sobbing <laughs> and saying, how are you making her do this? And it's like, I don't know, it just kind of works. <laughs> yeah. And uh, one of our most amazing kids was um, one of our first kids. We opened in 2009 with, with six children that all were on the autism spectrum scale to some degree. One of our most interesting kids was Sam. And Sam, Sam had Down syndrome, and he was autistic, and he had low tone, so he wore leg braces. Mm -hmm. And um, he was born premature and had been intubated for a long time, and when he was finally not intubated, he had an aversion, an oral aversion to food. So from the moment he was a small baby, he had a G-tube. He couldn't eat orally. Mm -hmm. And so they came to us with all of these things. They wanted to work on speech. They wanted to work on tone. They wanted to work on food. And so our occupational therapist, Mary, who wanted to come tonight, she's spectacular also, she was working on helping him eat. And we were working on his tone, and we were working on his speech. And, uh, and uh, the day that he ate for the first time, there was a dry eye in the house. <laughs> the whole farm was just had just lost it that day, and he was he was eating pudding, and we all had pudding all over ourselves. <laughs> and uh, and but it was a huge it was a huge giant step forward from the year and a half before he came to us. He got his leg braces off. He was starting to talk. It it was it was so many different areas that he progressed in, and he had he was six. He had failed traditional therapy, of course. and he had done everything, OTPT, speech and language, but it took, in some kids, it just takes doing this, this kind of therapy, an alternative therapy, if you will, but it just takes mm -hmm. this. And, uh, and when it works, it's so miraculous to see it. And what the trainer brings <laughs> to it, is what you guys individually, <laughs> your own personal selves, bring to it. Oh, yeah. And it just creates this huge sense of family. We've all achieved this together, and um, the miracle is something that everybody shares. The volunteers share it. The parents share it. And it's, it's just this incredible sense of community. I can't explain it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. I can't explain it. We're <laughs> way more than what this cortex is about. It's way more than the average person thinks a horse is capable of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, you're going to invite me out to see what you're uh, doing out we there? We can teach you how to ride. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. At my 86 yeah. years old. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I want to come out and see what you're about and uh, experience a little bit what, what you're about. You can see I'm a very sensitive human being, a very sensitive, sensitive animal. That's first consideration, yeah. So, 
Where do we go next? <laughs> One of the things that I think is important for people to know about Sycamore Lane, I think all of us here kind of share that, is that our mission is really access. I mean, there's people that need these services. And uh, so much of our fundraising efforts are towards the scholarships for the riders. And our veteran services are free. Any veteran who comes to us gets all the services that they want for free. And we believe very strongly wow, about that. Wow, that's terrific. Yeah. And who has a particularly interesting story about someone you're dealing with in your particular uh, field? Um, let's see, I guess I'll, I'll talk about kind of what has happened with the veterans program, which, um, you know, I was, I was really nervous about starting it, you know, because I really wanted them to come in and just be able to have a really great time and, you know, um, just an area where they could, you know, support each other and, you know, be social and work with the horses. And it's, you know, exceeded way beyond my expectations. Um, they come early and stay late. They <laughs> exchange phone numbers. They talk about, um, you know, what kinds of services, you know, um, they can access to be supported. Um, some of the guys have more horse experience than some of our other veterans, so they um, are also volunteering. Um, and some of the veterans that are, um, you know, going through the classes this term said, hey, can I stay around and volunteer next term? How can I help? Um, we've had a lot of interest in the veterans wanting to bring their families out. Um, so I just think that that's really great that they, you know, come out there and they just love being out there. Um, you know, I let them kind of each feel out all the horses and pick one that they maybe feel a kinship with that they want to work with. Um, you know, and it's a very emotional experience for some of these guys. Um, you know, some of them, you know, there yes. are tears shed. Um, they, they can sort of exchange thoughts and feelings from the horse without, you know, the horse judging them or mm -hmm. without the horse, you know. So creating that emotional bond with the horse is just really touching and then you know the icing on the cake was watching them create these bonds with each other you know because that's I wanted them to be supported trust, trust. by the horses yeah. but then to see them supporting each other was just really kind of a touching experience for me so um, they've far exceeded my expectations and um, you know we've had many requests um, a veteran signing up through Wounded Warrior Project for next term and um, I'm just really surprised with how it's taken off. It's just really great. <laughs> so. I never know about your expression. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, um. What about the staff that takes care of the horses? Who are those people? <laughs> oh, well, we'll throw that back to Suzanne. <laughs> 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 so, well, the facilities on, my, on our property, my husband and I and my two boys, Sevi and Antonio, we take care of the horses. And uh, uh, I couldn't do it without my husband, Gennaro, and my boys. I mean, they... Um, they help put the horses away at night, they feed them, and then we have um, people who help us clean the stalls every day, the like stalls are cleaned daily, and, uh, and turn them out. And, uh, and then the volunteers help us exercise the horses. Some of our volunteers who um, you know, participate quite a bit, they come on Sundays and they help us exercise the horses in a, in a real like riding lesson. Because our horses, mm -hmm. sometimes therapy is not the same as being ridden. And we want our horses to be involved in different kinds of therapy, but also remember what it's like to be a horse and be ridden and be asked for certain commands, even like being ridden dressage, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, because that's important for them to do. We need to change it up and so they're not bored and, and it keeps them from being burned out on therapy. Yeah, the mm -hmm. veterans, actually part of their horsemanship program is working um, on training techniques with the horses. Um, so they do activities um, that involve desensitizing the horses and also sensitizing them. And um, so I think it's just really great to see the veterans kind of owning that um, sort of horse training piece of it. <laughs> and you know, they kind of go in there a little bit like, I'm not really sure about this. And then kind of by the end of the activity, you know, there you really see them taking a leadership role with the horse. And so I, I really think that's neat that the horses are kind of getting that extra piece of training from them now. And the horses are just really doing a great job as well. Of so how does your your being in this kind of work and this association uh, affect your own personal lives away from the facility and away from the job? 
uh, is there a difference in your personal relationships with your loved ones and and friends? Have you noticed a change o over the years for yourself? Like for me personally, I'm still in the process of learning and growing and undoing some stuff as best I can that occurred when I was five or six years old. There comes my psychotherapy coming in. Play now. <laughs> and I, it, it's a never-ending process. It's <coughs> enjoyable. And sometimes when I discover I'm doing something now that I should have learned to be different in years ago, uh, it, it used to be a, a disappointment, but now here's a chance to get healthier, to be nicer, to be a more moving beyond my human uh, learnings. And don't start me on that direction. We'll go forever. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think uh, horses help uh, you remember what's important, right? They're not materialistic. Um, they're on their own time. Um, it's um, it's wonderful being able to work uh, at the facility we work at because of the environment that we're in, mm -hmm. and it helps us remember too um, being with the horses uh, for ourselves um, to relax, um, especially interacting with the horses and the clients. Um, you know, we kind of have to look inward at times um, to make sure that we're practicing what we preach. <laughs> It's called being. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. In the moment. You, you mm -hmm. find you're more in the moment now than before you started this. Well, of course, you've yes. had this a lifetime of this kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. And now I'm going to go away from here tonight thinking about stuff that I can still get healthier on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely think that um, this journey's changed who I am as a physician. Absolutely has. Because I, I sought this. Because I love, I love the privilege of taking care of people as a surgeon. Mm -hmm. But it, there was a void that wasn't filled for me, and um, and I couldn't find it. I volunteered at free clinics, and I do a lot of charity work, and um, it was doing this that filled my void. And I know it's made me a better listener. It's made me feel like I can reach my own patients in a deeper way. And when I see a patient of mine, because I do high-risk children, I do high-risk adults, when I see a patient of mine who needs these services, I can say, oh, wow, I would love for you to try this. So a few of my patients are in my program. <laughs> 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 and it's just, it's, just, it's just totally dimensionally changed who I am as a physician and as a person. I know it's changed my children, too. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a son who has a disability, and he's on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And uh, he understands, both of my sons understand the importance of taking care of others that need help. And I think being raised in this environment was the most wonderful gift that my husband and I could have given them, is to, to learn the importance of taking care of other people that need your help. Mm -hmm. And in such a fun way. <laughs> Do you think the horses are aware of what you're doing here tonight? <laughs> <laughs> No, but I have a daughter who believes that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they're very aware of what they're doing when they're doing it. Uh -huh. I mean, you know, Michelle or I might ride one of them, and, and they'll, they'll go, oh, I don't want to do that. Yes, you will. Oh, I don't want to do that. Oh, yes, you will. And, um, and they'll challenge us because we're advanced riders. But if I put a disabled little kid on their back, that cargo is fine china, and their personality completely changes. Really? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You can really see the difference. Oh, I bet you yeah. can tell stories mm -hmm. about that. Yeah. Well, I have some children that are um, squirmy, or <laughs> they pull their hair, or um, they just try to run their fingers through the hair, which doesn't <laughs> work very well with, with a mane. Um, <laughs> and the horses tolerate it at all. They do. And if the if the child is in a bad mood, the horse kind of moves along and tolerates until the child is able to calm down. And then from there, we're able to do other things. And the horse is so patient, so patient that I just think, wow, I kind of wish I had horse personality. <laughs> <laughs> they tolerate so much. Um, and the children just really respond to that. It is amazing um, to have a child scream and flap and and get overexcited and whip the reins around, and the horse just keeps going and keeps going. I can know eventually you're going to come down. Is this crazy? So, you know, it's I'm gonna amazing. It is amazing the changes that you see, and the child, the child responds to the horse, and the horse responds to the child. It's yeah. amazing. 
amazing things. How about the, the horse's uh, nutritional needs, uh, special consideration in what you feed them as compared oh. to ordinary horses? Our horses are so spoiled. Our horses have a better <laughs> dental plan than I have. <laughs> 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 Our horses have, um, um, we have superb veterinary services and our horses get all the immunizations and they get their teeth floated every every year and they get their feet done every six weeks and they have no. special supplements and uh, um, and and they look just beautiful I mean our, our horses are in, in incredible condition but a, a healthy happy horse is a horse that wants to do his job well and uh, and we've taken some rescues because like Buster we if the horse has the right personality and there's something that um, we think we can fix, whether it's injuries or things like that. We'll take them, and uh, like we took, uh, we took Summer recently. Summer's a beautiful part saddlebred, part quarter horse, and a veterinarian called me and said, I have a horse who's been badly injured, hmm. but we think if anybody can fix them, sick them or lane can. <laughs> <laughs> and she was lame on three out of four legs. Some, three some, out of four legs. Some people had rode her very hard and cantered her literally into the ground, and she had severe tendonitis and they were just going to euthanize her. And uh, we took her this past summer, and within two months, she was not lame anymore and already taking little kids on her back and incredible personality. She, she, she has an affinity for the littlest, cutest little kids, and she loves them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and How'd you do that? You know, you, you pick them based on their personality, and, uh, and if I can fix them, great. If, um, and if I, I, if, I, if I can't always fix them, I find them a really good home. Mm -hmm. but, um, but we're very cautious. We've probably interviewed over 350 horses for the 11 that we have. Well, 12. One's a miniature, but <laughs> <laughs> a miniature horse who, um, who goes other places. She goes to nursing homes. She does parades. She does um, uh, for festivals. She's done quite a few festivals in Oregon City this year. <laughs> and, uh, How about mating considerations for your animals? Hmm? Mating considerations oh, um, all of our all of the male horses are geldings they're uh -huh. all fixed and uh, and um, and we've only got one mare that we're considering breeding and that's our miniature mare the miniature <laughs> <laughs> she's only 32 inches high she's the size of a yellow I'm gonna find a mate for her <laughs> I, found, I, I found a champion miniature chestnut horse um, which is like a, an orange brown color and he's in Eagle Creek and we're hoping to breed her in March <laughs> you ne <laughs> never miss a, a trick. <laughs> Cover all the bases. <laughs> yeah, but normally we're not trying to just raise a lot of babies. Babies are a huge commitment, oh, but, yes. uh, but we are looking forward to another miniature horse. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got maybe three more minutes total before I've got to do some signing off stuff. So uh, any last uh, story or comment or thing that you think the viewers would be interested in about what you're doing and what you are, anything else we've talked about so far tonight? Um, I would just like to say that although um, the equine therapy uh, is alternative, it works, and unfortunately there's not a lot of funding that goes into proving scientifically that it works, it does work, and we all know that it works. Um, so I hope that in the future um, more organizations and corporate businesses can um, fund some research into equine therapy. Are you putting up the name and, and website for uh, the organization, yeah, Sycamore Lane Therapeutic Writing Center? Uh, that's it? Yeah. yeah I would How about uh, anybody else with a closing thought or comment? And we'll save you for last. I just wanted to say um, I am also the volunteer coordinator at Sycamore Lane, and we are always looking for volunteers, and they're you know, also really the heart of our program. We couldn't do what we do without the dedicated um, work of the volunteers. Um, and it really, you know, I think is as therapeutic for many of our volunteers as it, as it is for our riders and participants. Um, we have volunteers that lead the horses during the lessons, um, sidewalk, which is a, a therapeutic riding term for walking along next to the horse to support the rider um, either physically or um, you know help the rider remember instructions things of that nature um, or to just even provide you know moral support and cheer on a rider um, sometimes you know they need that extra smiling face to kind of help them be able to do something um, but also we use volunteers you know to help out around the barn help out administratively and of course we can always use volunteers to support 
support and come to our fundraising events as well. Volunteers, volunteers. Yes. Yes. We want to be sure we have enough time for you. Oh, I would just ask that um, anybody who's ever questioned what a horse can do, this is, this is definitely not a pony ride. This is medical therapy. And if um, anyone in the audience has a family member or someone they know with that would benefit from our services, please, please have them go to our website and contact us because we would love to serve them. And I don't want to leave you out. We, oh, have, no. we have another half a minute left, I think. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I would just say that um, if you have a child with a disability, and it doesn't matter what the disability is, I think that if your traditional therapies are not working, then this is definitely something that they should try. The children get so excited to be on the horse, and the horse affects the whole person that um, it's, it's worth the shot. And it's just a great bonding experience. <laughs> You've been wonderful guests. I'm so grateful and so thankful that you came aboard. And I'm going to follow up and come see what you're doing in person, if I may. And uh, I hope you enjoyed them. And uh, public pe uh, a few public service announcements, Mr. E. To get my uh, local broadcast schedule, go to my website, www.donbm.com. That's also where you will see my shows, Don Bam YouTube. In, on my website, again, you can get my shows on favorite links. And the American Civil Liberties Union, without the ACLU, our civil liberties would be cleared on the tubes. I think they're on the <laughs> bottom side now. Join the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union. It's a wonderful organization. I've been a member now for 40 years, I think. But get my shows broadcast by other stations in other parts of the country. Go to pegmedia.org. And uh, anything else, Mr. E? We've got to end corporate personhood with this uh, Citizens United decision. Corporations are persons. We're down the tubes. Our wonderful countries that uh, threatened with uh, corporations having the power of persons and spending as much money as they want. Oh, and thanks for watching. Remember KFC, not Kentucky Fried Chicken. Dr. Don's <laughs> KFC. Kind, <laughs> friendly, and charitable. Be kind and be friendly and be charitable. <laughs> You too. And you too. And you. And you. <laughs> and you. <laughs> Thanks again for watching. Good night. <laughs>